<laughs> you guys are in and out, man. Everything wow. you can and will be used against you in a court of law. So mind your tongue. <laughs> now a notification when it starts recording. That is that is weird. <laughs> yeah, they've made some updates. This is a professional thing. This is the real deal. This is actually I talk. turned it on. It was on there before, but I had it off. I turned it on just to make sure our ass was covered in case we ever needed to have it there. <laughs> Well, okay, okay. We're good. Yeah, that's good. So, since we are larding and we are, since we're larding, since we are starting and going live, I'm going to uh, go to the questions that showed up that I asked earlier this week about what you guys want to hear on Sunday, if this thing will work. One of the questions was about collectivism. I'm not sure what his definition of collectivism was, but I know what mine is. And I'm going to discuss some of that tonight because there was a, it was a pretty hot topic. There was a, several questions about it. The question, the question was individualism and how our people must oppose it to live better lives and promote collectivism. So I'm not a big fan of those kinds of things. And I'll tell you why. There were some really good questions about that. Hang on, just. I'm recording a show. I'll have to call you back. I need to talk to you. Oh, my gosh. You're live. You're on Facebook Live and YouTube right now. What do you want to say? Oh it's terrible. What's happened? Jeffrey's sick. He is? Yes, fucking come back. Fuck. All right, I will. Bye. Well, I guess you heard it. Looks like Jeffrey is sick, my son. That means I've been exposed. If I die, I want everybody to buy at least two or three books so my family will be welcome from here on out. I don't have to do shit. But I'm sure, I promise you, I haven't planned for a damn thing. God dang. The hits just, it's like a top 40 radio station around here. The hits just keep on coming. God damn it. There's a damn Tiger King when you need him. Anyway, collectivism. <laughs> So, my thing is, I'm a big fan of the sovereign individual. An individual that has free will, the individual that has the right to think of his own accord, the individual that has the right to build a future as he sees fit, the individual that has the right to worship, or have faith, or spirituality, or however he wishes to. Now, this is the United States of America. The idea of the rugged individual, the very, very pragmatic ideas that come with being an individual, building a future for themselves, um, the strength of it originates from the family. Okay, so the families were big and they built futures for themselves and they had great big farms and they carved out a, a piece of this world for themselves, much like their ancestors did building the kingdoms for themselves by their own hand. So that's, there's something to that. Now, that came under threat in the Civil War, probably with the Civil War, the the violation of state rights. But the idea that the industrial revolution when young men and women were leaving the farm to find a better life and then their descendants forming the nuclear family where uh, parents would grow up, they would raise their children and then now they go to college and then they go to college and they get a good job and they're on their own. And, and the nuclear family became the mainstay throughout the 50s after, after, 19, after World War II. Then along comes the age of Aquarius and the summer of love, which is 50 years ago. Where they all revolted against that. It was a change in thought process. So here's the problem with collectivism. How do you choose how to associate with people? What's the best way to choose how to associate with another individual in your life? Because by and large, what happens most frequently with groups or organizations is they come up with an idea to be against. And if there's one sure thing that will always happen if you form a group of individuals that are against something, that thing which you are against will become more powerful. Look through history, double check every case you can find. It. Find an issue where somebody didn't come up against something and the thing that they are opposed to became less than. So when we form a collective, what are we going to form it on? We're going to form it because we hate this group or hate that group. What happens when that group disappears? See, what it means is that I've connected with you in 
just one aspect of your being. I've made a connection with you, and now that group's gone away, and now I don't really like you anymore. There's no need for this collective. Okay, now what? And we keep it going. What do we do to keep it going? Because people are pretty screwed up. They'll find something else to hate. It has always been that way. It is the simplest, shallowest form of association that people tend to engage in. I am against this. Oh, you're against that? You're against it. Let's be friends. There you go. Here you have it. Well, I'm for this. Well, what are you for? So when you start talking about something that's positive, well, I'm for building successful future. Well, that's real hard to get people to do because everybody's comfortable. Why would I want to sacrifice this comfort? I got this group of friends over here. We don't like a bunch of this, but I'm probably not going to put any forth any effort to do something better. <laughs> so we end up with a real shallow kind of group mentality, herd mentality, uh, kind of a nasty nature, like water buffaloes or lions or some shit. The idea, the real central idea of most potter, post modernist thoughts, your Marxists, your communists, your socialists, is the idea that anyone that's talking is simply a voice for the group from which he derives his privilege. So if I'm talking, <clears throat> the only reason in my, way, my words have any way is because I speak from a position of white privilege. That's the gist of it. And they've written about it in many documents, many books. It's a, it's a hand, it's a mainstay. When a feminist talks, she's not talking because she is an individual. She is a mouthpiece for the organization or the group of individuals which she represents. She is effectively dehumanized. Now she may be hated. Now the whole group may be hated and therefore eradicated because this other group opposes them. So when we talk about forming a collective, what are we really looking at here? Do we have what it takes within these ideas of also true or indeed any of these pagan faiths to form the kind of healthy association with other individuals to build a tribe of care and concern that might be able to stand for something and withstand the storm instead of simply fall apart when the issue is no longer an issue? Because that's really what usually happens. It has, throughout the 20th century, allowed for some of the greatest atrocities against humanity one might imagine. Take the communists, for example, in Russia. Take the Holodomor in the Ukraine. Take the communists, for example, in China. Mao Zedong was willing to sacrifice 100 million of his people, so the other 500 million might follow and do what he says. The neighbors were willing to shoot the other neighbor in the face because they didn't believe the way they they ought to believe. That's an example of collectivism. And if we want to use it to promote like, so when you form a group of people that are in their collective mind, and you're willing to take the life of another individual because they are not part of the group or in that collective mind, um, What's the, what's the limit? What kind of mindset do you have to adopt to take the life of your neighbor because he doesn't think like you do? Well, that's part of me living a better life, isn't it? Isn't that part of what that means? Isn't that, isn't that promote collectivism and live a better life? See, nine times out of 10, when you begin to look at any individual that begins to follow the ideas of collectivism, what you're really hearing at the end of the day is there's some parts of me I don't feel like fooling with. And if I get a part of this collective, I won't have to deal with that. And all these other people can carry the weight. And I can neatly sidestep the issues of professional development or personal development or growth of any kind because I'm part of a collective. We're automatically right because there's so many of us. We can live better lives, even though this one over here is still a junkie and this one over here is still doing his thing. And this lady over here, she's still doing her nasty thing. Um, but they're part of a collective, so they're automatically right. Now, individually, if we look at a group of people that we're opposed to, we can pick out individuals and we can ridicule, denigrate them, and make ourselves feel much better about ourselves not having done a single thing to improve ourselves. But we're part of a collective, aren't we? We have the opportunity to live better lives. How so? By neatly sidestepping and ignoring those issues we must undertake to become something better? 
And yet, when I look at, it's a terrifying thing for an individual to be his own man, isn't it? Why he might not think the way I do. I, I might not be as important. But what if he says something and points out my flaw? Well, I, I'm not gonna be nearly as important. <laughs> One person came up with the idea and she's right. Let's talk about how it balances out. What does it look like in our lore? What does it really begin to come into being? How does a sovereign individual complement each other within a collective? Now we're talking. Now we got a good idea to work with. When a competent, capable individual desires to become associated with another competent, capable individual, through a connection that is one of affection, caring, love, kindness. Now something really neat happens. Now all of a sudden a group begins to form that they can take care of each other. They really don't care what's going on in the world. You see, if you look at the entirety of the Aesir, Aesir, and what Odin put together with that community that we all hold to be very holy and divine, you see a collection of very powerful individuals, each one representing some idea, some concept, some thought process, some action. And together, each very powerful in their own right, each very special of their own accord, each having made great sacrifice or suffering or endured trial or having gone through the fire, so as it were, so to speak, to become a part of something better, willing to make that sacrifice of self to be a part of something grand. See, that's real hard to get a comfortable human being to understand. To get someone that is very comfortable in how they live, it is very hard to convince them, if you want to be a part of this group, you're going to have to be better. And yet, if you join the military and you want to be a part of special forces, you're going to have to do some suffering. If you want to get in the Ranger back, you're going to have to endure some suffering. If you want to get in the Marine or Force Recon, you're going to have to suffer to be a part or associated with this group of fantastic individuals. Same thing for SEALs and every other so calm element out there. <laughs> to a lesser extent, you have to do the same thing to even be in the service of the United States. See, now that's a collective of individuals who have suffered together. They have formed bonds, which can be very hard to break because they give a shit about each other. They've been through and seen the toughest of times and the hardest of things, things we might only ever see in a movie or read about in a book. It's hard to comprehend some of that stuff. Their ideas are of bonds are not based on some high-minded $5 word about what the world should look like. It's based on the idea of we made it through, we got this. When you look at the Aesir, you see Tyr, who deals with his, with his father and mother and grandmother in getting a cauldron a mile wide in which to brew the mead at Eager's Feast. If you look at Thor, you see this individual who for the better part of, of the Eddas and the sagas is this, is this gigantic individual with a hammer smashing his way through opponents and enemies and protecting the realm, the warder of Midgard order of men and yet when it comes down to it and it comes time to protect the hand of his daughter we find a man of extreme intelligence handling the situation as best he knows how without violence why is that not growth is that not development is that not becoming something more to justify a seat at the table i think so when you look at heimdall born of, of nine mothers the warder of the heavens themselves there's something very special about him as well in the end he is the one that wrestles with Loki and they kill each other. He is the warder of the high-minded ideas that the Aesir and the Aesir represent, that the ego will routinely will put a human face on, dehuman, make them human, and rob them of their divinity so we no longer hold them in high esteem. The warder of heaven is the one that protects that. Odin sacrifices himself to himself, sacrifices an eye for knowledge. Frigga loses a son. Freya loses a husband and raises two daughters by herself. That's a common aspect in today's society. And their names literally mean treasure. They are treasure to heaven. Gerd or Gerd, Frey and Gerd make sacrifice to be a part of each other's lives. Frey sacrifices that very phallic symbol of the, of the warrior that's in, in, the, in his sword to the next generation. So he might adopt the role of the lover and the husband. 
He changes, he grows, he becomes something more and brings a beautiful bride into the tribe. See, all of those individuals deal with something. All of those individuals grow through something and they associate with bonds of respect and love and care for each other. Thor goes on a trip with Tyr to help him out. Frey's hand, Frey gets a little hand from his buddy to win the hand of Gerda. He goes on and on. And then when Balder dies and his, imagine when Balder dies, this wonderful son of Odin and Frigg, and he begins his journey through hell. Imagine finding him there in the high seat. But more importantly, think of what it must have been going on through Nana's mind to realize that the man that she had loved was now lost. What kind of environment must he have created for her? What kind of love must he have shared with her so that she was willing to undergo a journey in an uncertain form in a realm she could hardly comprehend. What kind of life had he created helped, helped ensure she had as his wife? Can we do that? See, when you start talking about collectivism, we have a hard enough time just being husband and wife. And we want to associate with a mass of people because we oppose something. We need to take a good, strong look at the examples that the Aesir and the Aesir provide. The ideas of sacrifice, the ideas of shedding something to become something more. Not overdoing it, but earning a place amongst other good people. Those are only established and strengthened with bonds of love, not with bonds of opposition or hate. They're bonded because they give a shit about each other. And in the end, they all stand up and fight for each other. Indeed, at Eager's Feast, when Loki stands up and decides he wants to blatantly demonstrate to everyone that he does not understand the interaction of the divine with each other, it is each god or goddess that takes a turn defending the other one. Well, there's a great deal of caring going on there, too. It is the rugged individual. It is the soldier. It is he who has made the sacrifice or she who has, un, who has dealt with the suffering that understands what it means to bond with someone at the proper and right way to move forward in this world. But to simply throw out the ideas that we must associate to live better lives, how so? What's the qualification or the prerequisite simply to associate with each other so we might live better lives? What would that look like? Well, I see example of it all over the place. And yet I don't see any of the ideas from the Aesir mirrored in those associations. I see individuals making backstabbing comments or slandering another person because, well, they don't think like we do anymore. Hmm. And? It's a terrifying thing when someone that stood next to you because you all oppose something, changes his mind and says, you know what? This is stupid. I'm not gonna do it anymore. Why, there's a real powerful threat to a person's ego, isn't there? Now all of a sudden they might not be as important in the world as they thought they were. See, the ideas that we use or typically have used as simple human beings have wrought havoc and destruction upon the rest of humanity for the entirety of the 20th century. 19th century as well. European colonialism, American westward expansion, the great world wars. And in the midst of all that, there were great plagues and diseases that we hardly noticed because we were too busy uniting because we opposed something. When are we going to stop opposing anything? Well, they'll run over us. They're going to do what they want. We won't be free anymore. Well, if you're part of a collective, who's going to run it? You? What's the qualifications of the person that's going to take charge of your collective? Will they make decisions because they care about you? Or will they make decisions based upon the best interest of the collective and you may have to be sacrificed? So who's running over who? Which is it? <coughs> who stands the best chance? The rugged individual who has raised a powerful, strong family and has that collective of family, of love and caring surrounding himself? Or the individual who is associated with a group of people because they hate something. 
who has the stronger ability to survive in this world? Because I assure you, that family that loves each other and cares each other has other family that loves and cares for each other. And now all of a sudden you're dealing with a very big unit. We have to be careful when we start talking about these things because they are not based on intelligent thought. They're not based on the ideas of bettering the world. They're not based on the ideas of becoming a part of the environment in which you live, which is an integral part of how our ancestors lived. Anytime they moved into an area, they did not separate themselves from the environment, they became a part of it. Their great, their great monuments dot the landscape of Europe and they have solstitial and lunar alignments to time their lives with the seasons and the world in which they lived. They were very much a part of their world. And yet here we are, separate from it in so many ways. And the best thought we can come up with is, that guy hates that guy, I'm gonna hang out with him. We'll form a group. We'll oppose the influence of things that scare us. When you get right down to it, the manipulation of those kinds of individuals who would rather be a part of a collective are always manipulated by fear of loss. There's no way to build a better world for our children. When should we start doing that? Now that we're all home and we have an opportunity to be with our children, how many of us are? Are we focused on the news and the thousand people that died last night? What's that gonna look like? Ask yourself those questions when someone wants to associate with you. Is there some part of this individual that I might really give a shit about? Do I care enough about myself to care about myself first? If you get right down to it, that's where it all has to start in caring about ourselves, following those examples of the gods and making those sacrifices of those things that stunt our growth and keep us from becoming something more. The strength of these pagan ideas has kept a toehold on the world for the centuries that monotheism has dominated it. They are still here. And now people in this trying of times are beginning to find them, use them to grow, use them to become something more, use them to stand up <coughs> and be that fine example of what it means to be the individual who has something to contribute to the people that he loves. That's all I got on the collectivism thing. Now, I hate to cut this short, but uh, I just got a phone call that, that my son is sick and I need to follow up on this. I do appreciate everybody joining me tonight and I thank you very much. And I hope you guys, whatever comes your way tomorrow, um, I hope you find yourself surrounded with individuals that give a shit about you, that love you and that will help you make it through this most difficult of uncertain times. Thank you very much. Be safe, Brian. I hope everything is going well with the, well, I hope your son gets better. I don't know what he can, yeah, I do too. All right, I'll talk to you guys. Later, Brian.